uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to give a talk about our uh, latest developments at IBM Quantum. And um, so this talk is really going to be about uh, some things or a couple of ideas at the intersection of uh, quantum chemistry, machine learning, and also, uh, of course, uh, quantum computing. So <clears throat> there is uh, a lot of ideas around of uh, what uh, quantum computers can do for machine learning. So uh, people are uh, thinking a lot about that. Uh, this is the uh, IBM view on uh, that point. So this is a uh, nature article that uh, we published last year about uh, binary classifiers that uses uh, that use quantum kernel to uh, potentially improve on uh, classical uh, classification problems. But uh, what I really like to uh, focus on in this talk is uh, you know, the other way around. So um, what I'm asking here is, um, can machine learning help uh, quantum computers really? Okay, so this is the uh, philosophy and uh, then uh, I'm gonna take the um, computational chemistry route uh, to show a, an application in which um, machine learning could give uh, a possible advantage uh, to our quantum computers. But uh, before getting to the machine learning part, so I'd like to um, give a little bit of um, <clears throat> you know, um, introduction on uh, quantum chemistry, on quantum computers, and especially <clears throat> where do we stand at IBM. So we started uh, quantum chemistry simulations in uh, 2017. This is our <clears throat> experimental uh, results on a um, six qubits. So we uh, got to the ground state of um, small molecules up to uh, radio my drive by <clears throat> by running BQE with the uh, hardware fusion ansatz. So the uh, question now is, uh, okay, how do we move forward and uh, how do we uh, keep improving on these results and make better and better uh, simulations of uh, molecules and materials on quantum computers? <clears throat> Uh, this is a slide. This is a slide which I think has uh, all the challenges that um, we have to face in order to um, improve uh, performance of uh, uh, quantum chemistry applications of quantum computers. So uh, you see on the left uh, there are what I think um, are the main um, quantum algorithms that uh, one can use to target uh, quantum chemistry application. So really we have uh, ground and excited state properties, we have uh, dynamics. So but when you look at um, all these algorithms and they really boil down to um, a couple of subroutines, which are uh, basically Hamiltonian simulation, you know, via your uh, favorite trotter or post, post trotter method or, and um, Hamiltonian averaging. And uh, so these two subroutines, they break down into uh, a bunch of challenges, which um, I have colored here in blue and yellow. So to distinguish them between uh, theory or uh, experimental challenges or software hardware, uh, I guess that the terminology here uh, depends a lot if you work in industry or academia. So uh, I'm actually not gonna go uh, through all these challenges. I just wanna say uh, something which is important so every every time you improve uh, one of these, uh, every time you improve one of these aspects, uh, it's certainly good for a uh, misc computing. So it's certainly good to squeeze uh, more out of the current uh, noisy devices that we have. But uh, you know, improvements and discoveries that we make um, in, in these fields are are, are going to be there also when uh, we're going to get fault tolerant quantum computing. Again, I'm not going to go uh, through all these challenges. I'm just going to um, I'm just going to focus on uh, the measurement problem. Okay, so why, what is the measurement problem? Why it is interesting? Uh, okay, so look at these uh, plots uh, from uh, our work in uh, 2019. So here's the outcome of a uh, BQE uh, performed with um, uh, error mitigation um, procedure, which uh, we call extrapolation to uh, the point of zero noise. Okay, so what we do here is uh, we perform the same uh, energy evaluation for um, a different level of effective noises acting on our quantum devices. 
And then we extrapolate. So these are those uh, colored dots uh, that you see both for um, the hydrogen molecule and for lutamide, right? And then we extrapolate. So once we have uh, that behavior of uh, observable that we want to measure versus the noise, we can think of extrapolating <coughs> those points to, um, to the value of that observable for zero noise, <coughs> which are these uh, green and blue dots here. Okay, so what's uh, one problem with that? <coughs> Excuse me. So one problem with that is that um, the precision with which uh, we retrieve those estimation is really important. So if you try uh, to think and uh, perform like a linear fit or try to extrapolate something which has stochastic fluctuations on top of that, so you're going to realize that the uh, performance of that extrapolation is going to be tied to uh, how much uh, stochastic noise you have um, in, in, in those points. So measurement precision is really important. Of course, it's important in running uh, BQE by itself, uh, you know, uh, optimizing a cost function, which is uh, stochastic, is certainly uh, harder than uh, optimizing a cost function without noise. All right, so we have this problem. Uh, we want to estimate uh, these beasts uh, very precisely. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a look, uh, this is an overview at lithium hydride amalgamium. As you see, there is, uh, it's defined on, on four qubits and there is a lot of polyterms. And in general, the number of polyterms grows with the uh, well, fourth power uh, in general, but uh, maybe like uh, third power if you uh, consider like realistic extrapolation on, on realistic uh, molecules. But anyway, it's the number of polyterms uh, as the um, molecular system increase in size really explode very fast. So a naive way of measuring this object here on a quantum computer would be uh, iterating through each one of these polys and uh, probing the qubit uh, in the basis defined by each one of them. This is a naive way. Uh, this is certainly uh, not the optimal way of doing that. So one uh, improvement that uh, one can do on that is uh, simply grouping those polys in uh, sets uh, which are in the boxes of this table which can be measured measured at the same time okay so uh, each one of these so we can reuse uh, the measurement outcomes uh, for um, each one of these sets uh, to estimate all uh, the polys in a given set so uh, this is what we use in uh, 2017 uh, to estimate our molecular energies and since then, uh, there's been a lot of research about um, you know, uh, tackling this um, uh, measurement problem. And uh, so I think this is a, uh, I tried to give a comprehensive list of all the uh, recent research on the subject. Maybe I apologize if I missed a couple of papers. But so the general idea is that uh, there is some algorithms to, uh, to tackle the measurement problem, which add to the uh, circuit depth for, um, to, to the add, they add to the um, uh, state preparation circuit depth, okay? So uh, that's good uh, if we had a full tolerant quantum computer on uh, current devices that we have, uh, that's not ideal, okay? So what we want is um, uh, protocols to increase measurement precisions, uh, precision without sacrificing uh, circuit depth. And then uh, there's been a bunch of, um, a couple of papers on, uh, that, that focus on retrieval of uh, generic properties of the quantum observable. So one idea uh, that I'm gonna present here, uh, it's gonna be uh, an idea that builds on uh, top of one of these algorithms for uh, retrieval of generic properties, uh, specifically uh, the idea of uh, classical shadow, which uh, I think was presented at this very same conference last week. And then are we going to show that the simple uh, generalization of that idea could uh, can give us very precise estimation for uh, molecular energies uh, without, of course, like without increasing circuit depth, which is a very important uh, thing for us. Okay, so this is a one slide uh, summary of the um, uh, classical shadow idea. I apologize uh, to the order, but uh, this is uh, really like what, what I could present in this talk. Uh, so. Uh, like broadly speaking, uh, what they do is they uh, perform a number of measurements, they probe their qubits in um, a measurement basis drawn at random, and then they store uh, this data set of, of measurements, outcomes, 
and they call it a classical shell. And then uh, later, uh, once this data set is produced, uh, later at the later stage, uh, someone comes and uh, uses the uh, measurement of this data set to estimate um, some uh, specific uh, you know, properties of interests of uh, quantum state, like quantum fidelity or uh, entanglement witness, all, all these uh, things uh, that, that you can uh, read in this cartoon. Okay. So uh, the idea, so is, is retrieving like generic properties of the quantum state, but uh, what we are interested in is really just retrieving just one observable. So one very complex observable, which um, of course is gonna be in our quantity, in our case, the um, energies uh, of the uh, molecular, the energies uh, corresponding to the Hamiltonians of molecular systems. So how would uh, the classical shadow algorithm look like if we just wanted to retrieve one observable? Well, it will look like this. Uh, so uh, outline in this um, in the in this way. So we uh, repeat this protocol for a certain number of samples, right? So we prepare our quantum state row. Uh, we uh, pick a random a measurement basis, um, so distributed on the uh, x y z direction for each qubit, for each qubit, and then. Um, we would measure, we would measure each qubit in, the, in a measurement basis drawn at random, and then we would use uh, those uh, single shot measurements to produce a uh, single shot estimation of um, the observable that uh, we are interested in. And uh, of course, like you uh, would have to uh, go to the details of this. Uh, so one has to use this uh, F function, which basically it's a measure of um, how likely it is that your um, uh, Pauli operator P, which is uniformly uh, drawn at random, matches uh, one of the uh, Pauli operators of the Hamiltonian and so on. But uh, this is the general idea. So once you get that uh, one shot um, uh, estimator, then uh, you can average it for a number of shot PKS, okay? So what, uh, this is the, this is a, Classical the, the proposal for uh, the classical shadow, which uh, I think has been uh, published on uh, Nature Physics some uh, days ago. So what uh, we're proposing here is uh, to do the following: so instead of uh, uniformly uh, randomly picking uh, the measurement bases for each qubit, uh, we're going to bias them. Okay, so now uh, for each qubit, uh, it's going to be sampled. Uh, it's going to be so, so, so the, the chances that we draw a uh, measurement basis in the X, Y, Z direction is going to be different uh, for each cube. Okay, and that's it. So the rest is going to be the same. And then, okay, then we ask ourselves, uh, now we have this uh, degree of freedom we can play with. So we can uh, change this uh, uh, distributions beta, which uh, model our uh, chances of uh, picking a certain X, Y, and Z uh, measurement basis for each qubit. And we can optimize uh, this distribution betas to, uh, we, we can optimize them over some cost function. Now, uh, what's gonna be this cost function? Well, uh, we know that uh, I think all quantum algorithms that uh, target uh, ground state properties uh, make the assumption that uh, one has to start from a good reference state, right? So this is not true for BQE. This is also true for uh, phase estimation, right? So if we don't initialize phase estimation with good reference state, uh, we're lost. We have, we have no chances of uh, retrieving the, um, the, 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 the ground state energy of the, the system we are interested in. So uh, we start from reference state. Now, what's the uh, reference state for, um, for uh, quantum chemistry uh, problems? Of course, like the simplest one is the uh, Hartree-Fock state. So what uh, we're doing here is uh, we are writing down explicitly, um, analytically, uh, the variance of the bias loss estimator that I've defined in the previous slide on this Hartree-Fock state. So on a... Um, a reference state, uh, which is a product state. We can do that. It's a, a computation which is classically efficient. And now uh, we can ask ourselves, okay, I want to pick this beta uh, for each qubit uh, to minimize this, this, this variance. So this, uh, some, uh, this I mean, amounts to optimizing this, this cost function that you see in the uh, second equation here. 
uh, actually a good thing about this cost function is that uh, if you do not, uh, if you exclude uh, the off diagonal terms, which are the, you see the, the terms here in which uh, QI is different from, from RI, uh, you're gonna get a, a convex, convex cost function. Yeah, so this, is, this is great. So uh, let's, let's recap here. Okay, so we have uh, introduced a uh, generalization of the idea of classical shadows by uh, biasing the um, probability of picking for each qubit a measurement basis in the x, y, z uh, directions. Uh, now we have optimizing, optimized those probabilities on a reference state, which can be uh, efficiently uh, computed classically and then uh, once we get those optimal uh, beta star, then uh, it comes this table. Okay, so this, in this table, uh, we have uh, computed exactly, okay, uh, the uh, variance of uh, different estimators, which uh, do not increase circuit depth, including our uh, estimator, which we call uh, locally biased classical shadow here. And you see that uh, by optimizing these uh, probability distribution betas over um, a reference state, we also get a very good variance uh, computed here uh, numerically uh, um, on the uh, actual ground state of the um, uh, Hamiltonian that uh, we are trying to uh, we're trying to compute the ground state of. So. Uh, <clears throat> Actually, we have a uh, paper uh, coming out on archive tomorrow. So uh, if you are interested in more uh, details, you can uh, check the paper out. Uh, we have also generalized the, um, the optimization for a single reference case to a multi-reference case. You know, in quantum chemistry, uh, you can, um, one can easily uh, compute perturbative uh, approximations to the ground state. So in that case, uh, the, the cost function is going to be different, but nevertheless, one can uh, optimize it. So uh, the uh, conclusion here is that so our optimizer uh, improves on uh, uh, estim previously known estimators that do not increase circuit depth. Okay, this is important. So we're not only considering estimators which do not increase circuit depth. And also we're not um, addressing like typical NPR problem which uh, arises in um, you know, trying to build bowlings. So um, it's, it's really, it's an efficient uh, result. Okay, so I promise you, uh, I was gonna uh, say something about machine learning. And uh, so let me add back uh, the blob, the machine learning blob to my uh, Venn diagram here. And uh, now let's move uh, finally to neural network, which is the uh, second idea I wanted to present in this talk. So uh, here we want to target uh, the same problem as before. Uh, we want to um, know precise uh, estimations of uh, complex observable, but uh, to do this, uh, now we're gonna use uh, machine learning techniques. Okay, so uh, neural network states. So uh, neural network quantum states, it's a, uh, a computation, it's a variational ansatz, um, which was uh, introduced by uh, Carleo and Royer in uh, 2017. What you see here, uh, this is a, a um, so this is a parametrization of the amplitudes of a wave function as a function of, um, sorry, as a function of, um, it's a, an expression of uh, the, an expression of uh, the uh, amplitudes of uh, given wave function expressed in term of a in terms of a neural network with uh, complex weights. So the, the neural network in this case, it's a, a restricted Boltzmann machine. So it's a shallow neural network. And uh, what would they have shown uh, three years ago is that uh, this uh, variational uh, ansatz is, it does a fairly good job at capturing um, ground state properties of interacting many body systems. So why is this uh, interesting? And uh, what does this has to do? What does this have to do with this talk? You can use that to estimate uh, observables on a quantum computer. So the way we do that uh, is, is the following. So we prepare a quantum state on a quantum computer, uh, for example, running uh, BQE and the, um, the, the the part in this cartoon that does it is this like gray quantum circuit here. Then uh, what we do is um, after that is we produce a data set um, of measurement outcomes by measuring 
uh, only in, in the different uh, Pauli bases that, that compose a target Hamiltonian problem. And now at this point, so instead of just uh, taking those measurement outcomes and averaging them, we train a neural network model uh, using that data set. So specifically, uh, we, train a, um, we train this uh, wave function here to match uh, the measurement outcomes uh, distributions that we get by probing uh, the uh, quantum computer. Okay, so in this, <clears throat> why, why we're doing that? Uh, we are doing that uh, because uh, at the end of the day, once this uh, neural network has been uh, trained with the um, uh, measurement outcomes coming from a quantum computer, then uh, we could uh, use this uh, now classically uh, efficiently uh, uh, computable object uh, to estimate the, uh, the observables that we wanted to estimate on the quantum computer in the first place. And uh, by doing this, uh, we are uh, avoiding the, uh, the, the disparities problem that we would have had uh, just by um, averaging the um, measurement outcomes from the quantum computer in the first place. Okay, so let me just uh, show you what are the results. So uh, <clears throat> uh, here on this, on the left panel, uh, you see um, energy uh, estimation uh, distribution. I believe this is for um, this is for uh, three molecules of uh, increasing size. So it should be um, the hydrogen molecule, uh, lithium hydride, and beryllium hydride. So on the left side, you can see uh, that's a, a distribution of uh, measurement, uh, the distribution of energy estimations that you get uh, with a quantum computer at fixed uh, number of samples. And on the uh, right side, on the right panel of this plot is the um, a distribution of um, the estimation of the molecular energies that we get by uh, using the uh, measurements from a quantum computer to train that neural network and then uh, probing um, and measuring directly uh, molecular energies on the neural network. So you see that there is a, uh, there's a huge uh, increase in precision. So what was before a very like um, uh, spread out distribution. So you see this, this uh, Gaussian here that, that go like uh, far well beyond the, um, the energy, these uh, red bars here, which, um, which correspond to um, um, measurement precision of I think uh, one milli archery. Now you can see on the right uh, uh, side of the plot, how much precise are uh, the uh, measurement distributions coming from uh, this uh, using the neural network estimator? And uh, so you can uh, notice that uh, these distributions are very precise, but actually they have a little bias. And so this bias uh, comes from the fact that um, the the training of um, the training part can. Uh, so the training part can be not perfect, okay? But a good thing about this bias is actually that it's always positive. So this bias is always positive because um, any, uh, so if we fail in uh, training our neural network, so the energy cannot, can only be a greater than uh, the ground state energies of the um, uh, quantum system that uh, we, um, that that can only be greater than uh, energy measurement coming from uh, the actual ground state. So uh, we have this, uh, basically we have a trade-off uh, between um, precision and, and, and uh, uh, bias in this energy estimations that uh, nevertheless uh, seems to be very favorable for um, our uh, neural network estimator. And uh, so uh, quantitatively, uh, you can, uh, we can, we estimate that uh, three orders of magnitude increase in uh, precision with respect to standard uh, quantum computing um, uh, estimations. So uh, with this, uh, I think I've, I've, I've wrapped, wrapped it up. I'd like to finish and um, yes, just, uh, I'd like to thank my uh, external collaborators, uh, Giuseppe, Giacomo, and, and Kenny, 
uh, Flatiron uh, Institute and the University of Zurich and the um, IBM team, um, which is uh, Charles, Sergei, uh, Rudy, and uh, Guglielmo. And this is, um, <clears throat> this is a summary of the uh, two ideas that I um, uh, introduced in this talk. So I've shown you two uh, new algorithms for the uh, precise estimations of uh, complex observables on quantum computers, such as uh, these um, fast growing uh, molecular um, Hamiltonians. And these uh, estimators have the, uh, the great property that, uh, that do not increase circuit depth. And uh, so one, one of these ideas is, is based on the uh, concept of uh, classical shadows. And uh, so what we've shown is that uh, through a uh, locally, through locally biasing these uh, classical shadow, we have uh, obtained an improvement over uh, the uh, state-of-the-art estimator that uh, do not increase uh, uh, circuit depth. There's gonna be um, a manuscript on the archive uh, coming tomorrow on that. And then uh, the second idea in which I um, actually use machine learning is um, this, this uh, idea of using a neural network for, uh, uh, to train neural network with um, uh, measurement outcomes coming out of quantum computers and to uh, probe, uh, to measure um, observables of interest directly on those uh, neural networks. And this uh, buys us uh, something like uh, three orders of magnitude improvement in uh, precision. Of course, there is this uh, bias precision trade-off that has to be um, uh, investigated, but uh, a good thing about uh, the training bias that we get is that it's always positive. So that's, uh, that's good news for um, operational algorithms. So uh, with this, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention.